Welcome to ECCB Connects. On this week's episode, we bring you part two of the 23rd Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Lecture delivered by Bevel Wooding on the topic, Leveraging ICT for Regional Transformation. In part one, Wooding shared his insights on the technological changes and trends occurring in our region. This week, he delves into the challenges that should be addressed to successfully capitalize on ICT development in our region as well as the opportunities ICT transformation can provide. There are many things you can use technology for, but I want to pick and focus on three things that I believe represent our area of priority. The objective is to shorten the gap between proclamation and decisive action. To use the technology to address vexing public interest issues and to build indigenous human resource capacity to first enable and secondly, to support our development agenda. If we're going to have a conversation about technology, we have to understand that context. It's not pretty, but it's where we are. And we also have to set for ourselves some achievable, practical targets that allow us to focus our attention and our development energies. So I believe that it's within the context of these challenges that we find the seeds of our opportunities. Because here's a fact that is little known and not often spoken of. The same technologies that are so radically altering the Caribbean and global landscape, those same technologies can be harnessed to fulfill our development aspirations. The same manipulation of the mindset of our Caribbean youth taking place from forces without can be used to shape those same minds from forces within. In fact, if used appropriately, technology can help overcome our apparent resource constraints and provide massive amplification of capacity, reach, productivity, and efficiency. I have the good fortune of serving inside of a, a living, functioning, operating Caribbean miracle called Congress of Libya. We are not supposed to, from this place, be able to have the reach that we have in nations across the world. We're not supposed to, with the limited resource that we have, be able to bridge languages and cultures from this place while we're doing it, using a combination of the factors that I want to share with you as we drill into this discussion. The positive signs are already around us. I can list for you a set of initiatives happening across the region that point to the potential of our people and our capacity. The technology to tackle our challenges exists. I've seen this firsthand. Our people remain our most valuable resource and our small size, the key to our agility and adaptability. And that's not something many countries or regions can say. The region has the capacity or the potential to turn on a dime, digital dime, virtual dime, but we could turn. Our societies are small enough to make swift changes. What we're facing, therefore, if we consider that we have the technology and we have the human capacity, what we're facing, therefore, is more a challenge of paradigm than of resource or technical possibility. How we frame not just our challenges, but how we frame the options for our solutions becomes a priority. I like this, this, this statement made by one of our Calypsonians, and they, they tend to very succinctly capture truth inside of lyrics. David Rudder said this some years ago in a, a song called Dedication. He said, between the wrist and the rubber, there is a new truth to discover. And I think this applies well to our efforts to connect our development aspirations with practical ICT implementation. The truth we must discover is the inner workings of what many call now the modern digital economy. Between the wrist, our capacity and intent to mobilize, and the rubber, the actual implementation, there is a way that we have to discover. And in, in my, my conversations, in my time in the trenches across the region, one of the things that stands out to me is how few people understand how with all of the talk and all of the investment in information and communication technology, few seem to understand how it works as an actual economy. What makes for the success 
successful deployment of information and communication technology. And that's what I want to spend a bit of time talking about. The digital economy develops when users shift from merely consuming content to producing and exporting content, facilitating digital transactions on interconnected networks. It seems simple, and it applies to all of the fundamentals of economics that we've come to know and love. But the content I refer to here is not just words on a web page. It is the delivery of digital services. It is the application of the information and communications technology infrastructure to deliver goods and information. Now, if we consider this to be the generic digital economy, let's focus on something more specific and relevant to us, the domestic digital economy. And I'll just change a few words to illustrate the point. The domestic digital economy develops when users shift from merely consuming content hosted outside of a country or jurisdiction to producing local content and facilitating local transactions on local networks. Do you understand the important distinction? You can participate in the digital economy generic and actually benefit someone else's actual economy foreign. Or we can choose to build the digital economy domestic and imbue with it, in it, through it, all of the necessary anchors that impact and positively develop our economies. Now, think of it in these terms. If you're a net importer of ICTs, you import your hardware, you import your software, you import your, your consultants to tell you how to use your imported hardware and your imported software. If you do those things, your local ICT-enabled industries suffer. Hewers of wood and drawers of water, they become in the digital age. Your import bill rises because now you have to get this technology from outside, maintain it using outside resources. You remain vulnerable to outside influences when it comes to appropriate customization or appropriate redundancies. You compromise your digital security and your consumers will have a diminishing appetite for local innovation and a growing preference for imported ICT goods. Sounds familiar? The digital economy is the economy. That's the open secret. And the things we do to protect the development and growth and advance of the economy are the same things we must do to protect the development and advance of our digital economy. That's why we'll be reckless or foolhardy to consider the role of ICTs in the region without understanding or considering our attendant responsibility to build the domestic internet economy or the domestic digital economy. It's also why investments in ICT must be aligned with identified local development needs. Those people on the curbs and corners idly trying to find a way to make the day pass by have a role to play in building out our digital economy. Such investments as a matter of principle and supported by policy must be for local actors and local interests. Those local actors in turn must support the local digital economy. If I put it differently, if we can increase the value of the digital economy, we do that by increasing the amount of local services available online to local consumers delivered by local actors. There's talk across the region of should Uber come in or should it not come in? We need Amazon to locate itself and its obvious efficiencies closer to home because we're so dependent on them. At one level, David versus Goliath, we cannot compete size to size, pound for pound, with the behemoths of the technological age. But who can get a group of mangoes faster to anti-gene than the person who close to anti-gene? You all with me? And if anti-gene could order it online, where online is not foreign online, but local online, what a wonderful world that might be. Those are the considerations that I'm saying we need to, to, to grasp 
because at the end of the day, the digital economy is an ecosystem made up of actors who are digital and non-digital. Physical infrastructure is part of that ecosystem. Human capital is part of that, uh, that ecosystem. Policy frameworks part of that ecosystem. Investment vehicles part of that ecosystem. And together, the overall viability and robustness of our economies depend on all of these actors being connected coherently if we have to see the kind of promise that we want to see in technology. And here's the thing about it that, 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 um, that I want us to, to really understand. Market forces alone will not generate societally optimal levels of ICT-enabled development. I repeat, market forces alone will not, that's N-O-T, not generate the societally optimal levels of ICT-enabled development. Leave it to the private sector. Maximization of profits is a priority. And you can't fault the private sector for that. They have shareholders to give account to. They have profit margins to hit. But who is going to give our consumers a better, faster, more reliable internet service they deserve? Not simply the one that gives the providers the highest margins. Who is going to put that under layer interconnected and underserved communities when market forces dictate that it is not economically feasible to reach out to our remote communities. Those things become a matter of public policy. They're investments that governments should make, but they're investments that they should not make. They're things that the private sector needs to do, but they're things that we ought not to reasonably expect them to do. And they're things that our entrepreneurs and our innovators in waiting, they're things that they cannot do for themselves to change the status quo. So, it will take a combination of strategic and practical mechanisms to be deployed if we have to change this context. Reforming the education pipeline, addressing public sector service delivery, dealing with regulation, competition and innovation, prioritizing programs, there are things that can be done. But what I want us to understand is that in spite of, in spite of this context, in spite of these challenges, in spite of the threatening developments that we're seeing on the global stage, in spite of the apparent head start others may have, there is actually real cause for hope, real cause for hope. I know it's not easy, and I'm, I'm, I'll be the first to admit this. I know it is not easy to shift a region, to change its behaviors and its accustomed practices, its power structures and its politics. But think about this. It's not easy, but a shift is already taking place. And that's why I wanted us to see the context first. Because whether you do anything, whether we do anything, whether our region does anything or not, something will happen. And so our question and our responsibility is, let's make the thing happen that we want to happen, not the thing that the tides will carry us to. The whole point of, of, of starting with the examples that I gave and the context that I gave is to allow us to understand where the tides are taking us. And to allow us to ask ourselves if that is the place that we wish to go to. My proposition is that if we do something guided by a revelation of our true capacity and a vision for our preferred future, and I have to add this, also guided by a faith that this is not only possible, but this is our divine mandate, then we can accomplish that which is in the best interest of our region. We can educate our people. We can. We can emphasize digital skills, but we also need to keep emphasizing fundamental competencies and critical thinking. We can put investment into priorities of policies that focus on continuous learning and capacity building to support this. We can do that. Sartre Lewis College is already looking at ways to head into new areas of training and community-based outreach. The University of the West Indies is actively exploring options in this area, but they can't do it alone. We can innovate. We have to, if we have to survive. We can innovate through cross-sectoral initiatives I can give you examples, time wouldn't permit, maybe your questions afterwards will, about what is taking place in the justice sector. Last year, we had for the first time 
a meeting, a gathering, a symposium of attorneys generals, judicial officers, security officers, and private bar members to discuss the vexing issues facing the justice sector. I was shocked in convening the meeting that it was the first time such a diverse group met. They're all part of the justice sector. And yet up to that point, outside of the unifying role that the possibility of technology plays, they didn't see the need to come together to address the issues that impact all of us. But it happened. And it allowed them to see that even though one sector may think it has the worst problems, they are shared problems. And the best approaches are normally the shared solutions. So we can innovate. At the same time, we need to celebrate the progress and put a spotlight on incremental achievements. Part of what I've seen across the region is this, this, this lack of understanding that good things are happening. A lot of emphasis on the bad things that are happening and a huge amount of emphasis on good things happening elsewhere, which leads people to believe that if you want to be where the good stuff is, you can't be here. And this, I don't believe, is just the role of the media to change. The same tools, the same social media tools, the same online platforms that are being used to feed corruptive stuff to our societies is the same platform or are the same platforms we can use to say, hey, we actually have a good thing going here, and we could make it if we try. So our investment in these areas are guaranteed to bring greater returns and the cost of maintaining the status quo. Everybody with me? This is the context we find ourselves in. The tools that are bringing the wave of challenges to our region are the same tools that we can use. And the people who many are seeing are not using the technology responsibly or productively are the same people, given the right tracks, who we can turn to to see our way forward. Every sector has a part to play in this. Governments have to lay the tracks and accelerate the policy and legislative changes needed. Our academic institutions, well, they need to work in closer collaboration with industry. Our leaders at every level must model the change we wish to see. Actions must synchronize with words. And here's a wonderful thing about the region. A lot of the solutions, when you drill into the sectors, are written somewhere in some report in somebody's filing cabinet. We're not at a shortage of solutions of what should be done or what should be tackled. What we're looking at is how to activate it so that we can actually, in our time, actually bring it to pass. So I have seen in some examples where our youth are brimming with ideas about how technology can be used to tackle our challenges. If anyone here has done any kind of outreach to young people and give them a chance to say, what would you do if you had to tackle fill in the blank? Issues in health, tourism, industry. They have ideas. They need to be unleashed. In closing, I want to remind us of the words of Sartre Lewis, which I think are relevant uh, to this whole topic. And he said this. He said the collective judgment of new ideas is so often wrong that it is arguable that progress depends on individuals being free to back their own judgment despite collective disapproval. And I want to use this statement in the context of saying, lay the tracks, provide the fuel, and unleash our youth. I have seen our youth with ideas that got turned down by people who just can't believe that what they're proposing, because it is different, because it is unusual, because it is unprecedented, that it cannot be done. And so Arthur captured it well when he said, the, the way that we're moving, this technology-enabled future that we're going into, is not a future that you can say is an extrapolation of our past. And we need the young minds and the young voices and the young at heart to be able to experiment and explore the frontiers of our new digital landscape. And we need to give them the access to do that. Because at the end of the day, technology in and of itself is never the reason why things change. How people 
human beings choose to apply technology, that's the real catalyst for change. And we have a choice to make. We must not hold back our people simply because what they're proposing to do through ICTs is different or unfamiliar from what we once knew. We have to unleash them and we have to empower communities. My position is this. I think that given the right fuel, the region can be ignited with trademark Caribbean creativity and trademark Caribbean talent and capacity. I'm optimistic that we can move boldly forward from intent to implementation because ultimately, ultimately, ICT-based development is not about ICT. It is about development. And we all have a part to play in development. For this region, for this sub-region, for this country, we have and always will be the only legitimate and authentic architects of our development destiny. And that is what this is about. That's what I want to leave you with this evening. Thank you very much. We're almost at the end of season eight of ECCB Connects. The final episode airs on 28 November. While we're on break, be sure to stay connected with us on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Join us in January 2019 when we'll be back with new episodes. ECCB Connects, who we are, what we do, and how we serve you. That's it for this week's episode of ECCB Connects. Join us on 28th November when we'll bring you the final episode of this season, where we'll share with you Governor Antoine's remarks at the 29th Annual Conference with Commercial Banks. See you next week.